It gives one energy and improves one's memory, but it also produces depression, insomnia, and sexual impotence. It's taken with the family, at weddings, and at religious events and at town council meetings. Some people take it to work better and others take it to study. And there are also people who take it on weekends when going out with their girlfriends or while having a few drinks to stay awake. While cultivating chat, it must be well cared for during the first six months. The weeds growing around it should be cut and the plant must be watered often. It is also good to fumigate them with smoke, which helps the plant grow good leaves. The tree normally grows only between 1 and 2,000 meters above sea level, only where there is no frost and a sufficient supply of water. The mountains of Harar and its surroundings offer the best chat in the world. It's consumed in Somalia, Djibouti and Yemen, and it is even exported to the United States and England, where it is legal to consume it. Several tons of chat leave these lands every day and are distributed throughout the world. It must get to its destination quickly, however, because in barely three days the plant loses its narcotic properties and becomes useless. Chat does not have a specific growing period. It grows throughout the year, and these mountain highways to the airport or the local highways form part of the landscape of the Horn of Africa. Chat has a long history. It has been consumed here for centuries. When there is a Muslim wedding, for example, everyone comes together to enjoy chat, and then they carry out all the other traditional rites. The Czechs, the religious leaders, also consume chat and then read the Quran. There are some who consume chat since they have nothing else to do. They just spend the day high on this plant. Women also like to enjoy chat. My friends and I get together at one of our homes once a week and we talk while we eat chat. The origin of chat is unknown, although it has been confirmed that there are plantations that have produced this plant for more than 500 years. As for the rest of the stories, they are only legends about its origin. The stories say that it is found in Yemen and even in Somalia, but chat has always come from Harar. Less chat was eaten in the past than today. Its use was exclusively intellectual or social, and idle people dedicated to the consumption of drugs didn't exist. Women have been responsible for maintaining the consumption of chat within traditional practices. It's very odd to see women affected by overconsumption. But now I, a boat lost under the hair of coves, hurled by the hurricane into the birdless ether, I, whose wreck, dead drunk and sodden with water, neither monitor nor hand ships would have fished up. Who ran, speckled with lunula of electricity, a crazy plank with black seahorses for escort, when Julys were crushing with cudgel blows skies of ultramarine into burning funnels. I, who trembled, to feel at 50 leagues distance the groans of behemoths rutting and of the dense maelstroms, eternal spinner of blues immobilities, 
I long for Europe with its aged old parapets. Christians have always considered Chat to be a Muslim vice. One of the oldest references to Chat in Ethiopia forms part of the threat by a 14th century Muslim king who wanted to plant Chat in the capital of the Christian king. This is how the traveler Richard Burton described the sensations of silent contemplation that he enjoyed during these evenings of Eastern ecstasy. It is the satisfying delivery to the existence of animals, the passive pleasure of the mere senses, the pleasurable weakness, the dreamy tranquility, the building of castles in the air. In the East, man is satisfied with resting in the shade, happy alongside the bank of a sparkling river or the freshness of the protection of a perfumed tree, smoking a pipe or sipping a cup of coffee. But above all, by disturbing the mind and body the least amount possible. The problem being conversation, the dissatisfactions that memory can cause, and the vanity of thought, the most unpleasant interruptions. In this ancient palace in Harar, Haile Selassie, the last Ethiopian emperor, was born and lived. Haile Selassie was governor of Harar from a very young age. He grew from his privileged position as governor to become a contender to the throne after the death of Menelik II. After the assassination of the emperor in 1975 and the seizing of power by Mengistu's communists, the family of Haile Selassie was driven out of this home. At present, it's occupied by several families that have divided the space in a very non-aristocratic way. A naturist doctor, Saik Jadyi, has his clinic on the bottom floor and claims that he cures cancer and diabetes as well as other less serious illnesses like diarrhea or the evil eye. God brings on these illnesses and takes them away when he wants. Many people have been cured with these medicines. For example, those who have swollen feet or swollen neck and women with chest problems. Even the Ministry of Public Health has tried my medicines and accepts them. I have cured many people. It does not cost Saik anything to rent this building. His consultations are free, and the local government has ceded the house to him in exchange for the services that he offers the community. <laughs> To cure people, he uses medicinal plants that he himself collects in the mountains near Harar. 
He is one of the last heirs to a tradition of natural medicine that goes far beyond what historians are able to remember.